the six chief parts. We are into the, the, the gospel, the creed. We're getting in uh, pretty, pretty fur here. So, um, the first article, let's say this together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What does this mean? I believe that God has made me and all creatures, that he's given me my body and soul, eyes, ears, and all my members, my reason and all my senses, and still takes care of them. He also gives me clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home, wife and children, land, animals, and all I have. He richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support his body and life. He defends me against all danger and guards and protects me against all evil. All this he does only out of fatherly, divine goodness and mercy, without any merit or worthiness in me. For all this it is my duty to thank and praise, serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. Okay, last time we watched a video. We're not going to finish that video because I think we saw enough of it. But... Um, uh, a video on creation, but not really on creation, on evidence of creation in the world today. Uh, and it looked at a couple of things. Um, um, one was the willingness of the scientific committee to believe in evolution, even if the, the scientific evidence says it's not true. And you remember we, we, there, they interviewed a scientist about this bone that they had found someplace in Montana. And it was a great big bone out of some kind of a dinosaur, I don't remember that, but they had broken the bone open and inside the bone there was soft tissue yet. There was like blood vessels, capillaries and things inside the bone, which, I mean, there, there is blood vessels inside of our bones, but we're still alive. Uh, after we die, that very quickly kind of goes away, it deteriorates and, and um, if it happens a long, long time ago, it fossilizes and becomes rock. Um, Does it still break easily? Well, it depends on what kind of rock it becomes. And most of it, you know, I'm not really sure the process of fossilization. I'm not sure why some things fossilize and others don't. Uh, but, um, you know, for the most part, our bodies would simply deteriorate. They'd go back to soil like anything that dies. Um, but, uh, but sometimes they, fo they fossilize, and in that case, the, the, out, the bone had fossilized, the inside had not. And they, could, they didn't know why that was. And, and they were saying that because of where it was found or the kind of dinosaur it was, that it was 60 million years old. And the, the, quest, the people interviewing the scientists were saying, well, if, if this has been laying here for 60 million years, how can some of that soft tissue be there still? Why has it not degraded into soil, dust? Why has it not turned to stone in 60 million years? And she said, no idea, we can't explain that. But she still insisted that the bone was 60 million years old. See, they won't question that because that's what evolution says. And that's how science works these days. Everything it's not analyzed on its own scientifically. It's analyzed based on where it fits into the theory of evolution. And when you do that, everything fits into the, the theory of evolution because you make it fit. And, uh, and so anyway, we, we saw that. And then we saw the part on Mount St. Helens uh, that the... Uh, the volcano that erupted in uh, the western United States, I believe the mountain was actually uh, in Oregon. It's right on the Washington-Oregon border over there in the Sierra Nevada mountains. And um, it, it was really the first time that scientists got to really closely observe a volcanic eruption. Uh, because it happened in the United States where we have a lot of scientists and we got a lot of cameras and we got all kinds of stuff. And, uh, and because it happened in the 1980s, you know, so it, there was, we had technology to analyze things and they analyzed the ground movements and they analyzed the temperatures and, and the smoke and everything. Uh, and so they were ready to 
record it when it erupted. And so there's a lot of film of it and there's a lot of uh, uh, scientific readings from it. And, and it was kind of incredible, some of the things that happened. We didn't look at the trees in the lake. Some trees got washed into a lake and something happened with those, which was kind of amazing and, and sort of goes against what evolution's been teaching for a long time. But the main was, one was the, the canyon that was formed. There was a canyon formed through this where there wasn't a canyon before. And the canyon, if you recall, looked just like the Grand Canyon. It was smaller, but it looked just like the, you know, that same jagged edge with the, all the little tiny layers in it, um, just like the Grand Canyon. And how long did it take to form the Grand Canyon? Well, your science teacher will tell you it took millions of years, probably tens of millions of years for that canyon to form. And the, the canyon in Mount St. Helens formed in two weeks. And they watched it. They recorded it. They know it formed in two weeks. But yet it doesn't cause them to question that they're telling people that the Grand Canyon took millions of years to form. Is it a t different type of rock? Because it's in a different type of place. No, no. It's, it's the same. And the thing is, the rock itself formed in that period of time too. Because there wasn't rock there, it was a forest. And the, the, the rock formed and the canyon formed and they watched it all happen. Uh, because one thing that they saw was, well, and unfortunately you kind of missed the video, didn't you? But um, kind of when the, when the volcano erupted, it did, didn't just spew out lava out the top like you, you picture a volcano. There's kind of an explosion and one part, one side of the mountain kind of blew off and it went and it just slid down. And it was soil and rock and, and water because it was a snow covered mountain and the snow melted very quickly because the, the steam and the lava were, you know, they're hundreds of degrees. And, and so the, it, it became mud and a kind of a flood coming down the side of the mountain literally at hundreds of miles an hour. Uh, and so uh, it, it all shot down into this valley, which was a fertile valley full of trees, um, you know, the way you picture the, the northwestern part of the United States to be, a uh, big forest. And, um, and the scientists expected that all of that stuff that went down would just kind of be jumbled together at the bottom. And what they found that it wasn't, that even going down at high speeds, it divided itself out into layers. And so that rock that formed had tiny little layers like you see in the soil. And the canyon formed uh, immediately. And it was, uh, you know, within two weeks. And, and it was, it's essentially, you know, it's uh, limestone, sandstone, the same kinds of stuff that you see all over the place. And the canyon formed just like that. Um, and the thing is, Nobody questions, well, are we right about the Grand Canyon? Are we right that the Grand Canyon took millions of years? Nobody questions that. They try to take this canyon, which I don't even know the name of it, it probably has a name now, I would think, but um, this canyon at Mount St. Helens, and they, they try to fit that into the same narrative at, that they've been saying for years, was that the Grand Canyon formed over millions of years. Now, if you have this one that formed over millions of years and this one that formed in two weeks, which is right? Both. Both? It's possible, but nobody saw the Grand Canyon form, right? They're guessing at that. We did see the other canyon form. We know it formed in two weeks. We have it recorded. We have pictures. We have video of it forming. Uh, we know how it formed. Remember they had those pockets of steam that would burst and create these holes in the ground and then they would fill with water and the water would flow from one to the other and it would just, it just very rapidly wore through the, the soil and formed very fast. So the, the reason I showed that was not that you became experts on Mount St. Helens 
or geography, but just that you understand that what you get taught in school, and you will be taught a lot of stuff in school about evolution. Evolution is not proven, and yet scientists treat it like it is. Rather than looking at the evidence independently, and I, I, I'm not saying that we should decide which is right, you know, millions of years or two weeks, but at least when we see a canyon exactly like it, formed in two weeks, we should probably question the million of years, millions of years. We should probably say, well, I wonder if that estimate is wrong, because this one is so drastically different. And we saw this. And much of science is based on observation. I mean, you do an experiment and you watch it and what happens when you do this experiment. And in the area of evolution, much of their science is guessing. I mean, they do observe things, but then they try to figure out how that happened. And, and I understand, because we're talking about things that happened before we could witness it or film it or anything like that. But at the same time, uh, when you have something that's observable, scientifically, that should carry more weight than something that you did not see. So, anyway, so we looked at that, and, and uh, all I ask is that as you go through science, uh, and, uh, and you'll all be in science for a number of years yet, um, just keep in mind that, that there's a lot of guesswork, and that these things are not proven. Evolution is not proven. If it was, it would be a law, not a theory. And, and, uh, and so, uh, creation's not proven either, but we should certainly look at that option. And because creation is in God's word, and we believe God, God's word to be true, uh, we believe creation. Uh, we believe in a young earth, all of these things. And, uh, and like I said last week, you can go to YouTube and just type in creationism, and you can find all kinds of videos out there and all kinds of things. Um, you know, I saw an interesting one probably a year ago or so when I was looking through some videos and there was one on, on woodpeckers. And it was one particular kind of woodpecker, but I don't remember what it was. But anyway, this kind of woodpecker hits the, hits the wood so hard that his eyes should actually pop out of his head because there's that amount of force. But what the woodpeckers do is they close their eyes when they hit. And that keeps their eyeballs in, keeps everything within uh, boundaries, and then, but then they, uh, they pull their head back, open their eyes, look to see where they're gonna hit next, close their eyes and hit it. And they do this like 10 times a second. Does that sound like a skill that happens by chance, by evolution? It, it doesn't. It almost sounds like they're designed for that. Like that's how they're made to be. Uh, and, and there's all kinds of things like that. You know, it's, I, I've seen videos on the, uh, the human eye. The human eye, which, you know, we don't think much of it, but it's a highly complicated thing, the human eye. If you don't think the human eye is complicated and our vision is complicated, watch a good major league a baseball outfielder sometime. When the ball is hit off the bat, almost always their first step will be in exactly the right direction. Now how did they do that? I mean that bat is probably 200 feet away from them. And, and you know there's strange background going on and, and you know it, heads, and it comes off the bat in a certain way and almost immediately they know where to go. And they know, you know, if it's going to fall in front of them or behind them. And their depth perception is very good. And, and all of your brain is making all those calculations. You know, if I were to toss a ball to you, you'd drop it. Olivia, would, Olivia it. would catch it. You know, <laughs> but if I were to toss a ball to Olivia and, and she caught it. Well, think of what goes into that. That your eyes are determining how far away that ball is. And which direction, you know, do I have to reach you with this hand or do I have to reach you with this hand? And some of that is learned, certainly if you, if you do that with a child, um, they often don't know what to do. 
but your brain is making all those calculations. It's calculating the angles because the reason we can we have depth perception is because we have two eyes. What if you only have one eye? Then you don't have depth perception. Or you can, you, I guess they learn tricks around that, but, but see the thing is our brain actually calculates because our two angles, our, our two eyes see things at different angles. Like this, they're, you know, I'm exaggerating now, they're turned in like this. And so, um, so, you know, this, the angle of this eye is different than the angle of this eye. And we don't understand fully what that means, but our, our brain knows automatically to, to do the calculation and, and it can determine how far away it is. I mean, roughly speaking, it won't tell you eight inches and you know, eight and five eighths inches or something like that. I mean, but I wish. It will tell you. Hmm? I wish. Yeah, well, that would be nice, wouldn't it? But, um, you know, so complicated. The eye uh, itself, so many parts to it. You know, there's the, the lens and the iris and the, you know, the round part. What is that? Just the eyeball? Is that the official word? I the don't know. The naked eye. Anyway, and, yeah, and, the, and there's guck inside of there. And then on the back, there's a, the, the retina where the light hits and, and the, the lens adjusts to, to focus that on the back. And, and that's why sometimes you squint. You don't even think about it, but you squint to get things to, to focus. And, and scientists have admitted that there's, see, evolution would say that stuff had to form one piece at a time. You develop one thing and then if that's useful, you keep it and then you develop another thing and you keep it and you develop another thing and you keep it. But with the eye, none of it is useful unless it's all there. So it's kind of like you don't have an eye and then all of a sudden you have a complete eyeball. And evolutionists say, well, there's no way that happens. There's no way that, there is no way that we have an eye, honestly. Unless there was some kind of an intelligent design to us, which of course there is. Um, I don't know if I talked about the science of intelligent design. Uh, there is a science called intelligent design. And what it does is it analyzes things and says, did this happen by chance or was it designed? Okay, so for instance, if you're out uh, digging in your yard and you dig up a rock that looks like an arrowhead, how do you know if it is, or if it's just a rock that looks like an arrowhead? Well, the science of intelligence de design looks at it and says, you know, well, how many times was it broken to form this or chipped or, you know, how, how complicated is it? Um, and I don't know all the criteria, but they look at it and all of these criteria and they can determine, at least within some sense, uh, this was either designed or it just happened by accident. You know, the fact of the matter is you could find a rock about this big, perfectly round with three holes in it. It's not necessarily a bowling ball. Chances are it is. Somebody left a bowling ball in your yard. That's always dangerous when somebody leaves a bowling ball in your yard. But anyway, that's the, that's the science of intelligent design. Well, some scientists took the rules of intelligent design and applied it to the human body. And what they came up with is there's way too much complexity for this to have happened by accident. That the human body is intelligently designed. Well, of course, the problem with that to most scientists is that means that God made it. And that's a problem because they don't want to believe in God. But anyway. So all I'm asking is that as you go through science, don't just accept what your teachers say is true. Because it maybe isn't. You know, some years ago they found a rock in Antarctica and they announced on the news that it was from Mars. So I decided to read up on it because I thought, well, this is strange. How did they know this rock is from Mars? And they said, well, the makeup of all of the elements in this rock is similar to the makeup of rocks on Mars. Of course, they admitted it's also similar to the makeup of a lot of rocks on Earth. But they wanted us to believe it was from Mars, because that's a little more spectacular. 
There's no reason to believe it's from Mars. It, it was found on Earth, and it was made up of things that we find on Earth. So why would they think it's from Mars, even? Well, because they wanted a headline, I think. You know, scientists make their money off of being, writing articles and producing headlines. And, and you know, these big, the scientists at these big universities, they want everybody to read their stuff. So it's a lot better. If you find a rock in Antarctica, it does, it's not much to say, well, somehow it got here from Africa. That's not gonna thrill anybody too much. But if you say it came from Mars, of course they had no idea how it would get from Mars to the Earth and land in Antarctica. And they, they had no proof that it was from Mars, except that it, made, it was made up of stuff that you find on Mars, which of course you actually find on Earth too. But that's kind of the way science has gotten. It's crazy. So don't just accept what, what your teacher says as true. You're smart enough to know that teachers don't always tell the truth. They don't. They don't. And another subject, the subject of English. You guys like Eng English class? Of course you do. Everybody loves English class. Um, you know, probably not yet, but in the next few years you'll be reading things or reading books and things, and you'll, you'll be asked to talk about the symbolism in the book. You know, in the, in the book, The Scarlet Letter, what does the color red symbolize? Well, anyway, a, a university student doing some advanced work, I think it's 20 years ago now or something, wrote a letter to 150 published authors, like important authors, people that, whose names we'd recognize wrote to 150 of them, asking them if they used symbolism in their writing. Half of them answered. I think it was 75 out of 150 answered. And most of them said no. And yet all of our classes, English classes, are, are asking us to find symbolism in these things when they never intended for there to be any symbolism when they wrote it. So how can there be symbolism if the author didn't? Well, anyway, it's, it's crazy. Sometimes schools are a little crazy on how they teach things and what they say. Uh, and certainly sometimes there is symbolism. Color red in the scarlet letter, by the way, is an important symbol uh, for the, the people in that book. Have you ever read the book, The Scarlet Letter? No. Nathaniel Hawthorne. It's a good book. I don't know if they read it anymore, but um, I did when I was in high school, so you should have to, too. So you can read what well, whatever your teacher tells you to read. What do you read? What are you reading this year? Berman Watson just went to Birmingham in 1863. What? The no, Watsons not 1863, 1963. The Watsons go to Birmingham, 1963, so it's about race. Yeah. Okay. Wait, what English, what reading class are you in? Um, Grace. She knew. What are you reading? Chopping up wood. No. Okay. Well, whatever. All right. Anyway. So that's all I'm going to say about uh, creation versus evolution. Please don't just accept what your teachers say is true because there's a lot of stuff showing it not to be true. And I firmly believe, and I've done a lot of reading on it, and I was a very good science student when I was in school. Um, I firmly believe there's more evidence in the world of creation than of evolution. There's more evidence that the world was created quickly with powerful forces than that things happen slowly and gradually. Anyway, you can make up your, your own mind, but uh, don't just accept what you hear is true. All right, so uh, first article, does God provide all that we need? Of course, the meaning says it does. He also gives me Clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home, wife and children, land, animals, and all that I have. Is he is he providing for us? Does he provide for you? Does he provide for you? Does he provide for you? Oh, sure. Now you might say, and and you would be right in saying this. Well, okay, God provides what I have, but honestly, my parents buy it at Walmart. So maybe we could say Walmart. Provides 
our bodies or our needs of body and soul. And there'd be some truth to that because we do buy our stuff at Walmart. I mean, it's really about the only place in town to get much in terms of groceries. I think they have some at the dollar store, but food that I have to pay a dollar for, I'm a little skeptical personally. But anyway, no, they have some good stuff for it. I've actually eaten food from the dollar store. It's okay. But, but see, what God does is he makes the earth very abundant. It provides more food than we need. And he gives us the ability to earn money, puts us in a family where we have parents who earn money, so that that gets to us. It, the food doesn't just magically appear on the plate. That's not how God does things. But he does put all of the systems in order so that we are able to uh, to eat, to have clothing, um, all of these things. Um, you know, regularly, scientists will say, well, you know, the, the earth is overpopulated. You've probably heard that, right? There's too many people. Too many people. People are going to starve. You know, they were saying that when I was a kid. And there was like 25% uh, of the people there are now when I was a kid. It's doubled at least a couple of times since then. Um, well, if, it, if they were going to starve back then, but there's so many more people now and, and we're still not starving. What's the, how can that be? We created like more food in areas. Yeah. And we're like taking more technology to grow more food. Yeah, we're, we're able to figure out how to grow more. The earth, and there, we don't even know what the limits are to the earth in terms of producing things. And you know, they've actually figured out now, like for instance with tomatoes, some of the best tomatoes are grown with no soil at all. So you can actually, you could have a, a 20 story building, you know, like this big around and you could grow just millions of tomatoes and they don't need to be in the soil because they, they have, they're able to grow without soil now. And, that, and that's what God put into the incredible way things grow. And, and they do, they grow incredibly. Um, if you don't believe that, look at a crack in the sidewalk sometime. Are there cracks in the sidewalk that are just cracks? Mm -hmm. No. There's usually something in it, right? Like grass. You know, in, in my, uh, my sidewalk, in front of my house, I keep getting trees coming up through there. It's like, come on. I keep pulling them out, pulling them out. One of these days, I'm just going to bust that square out and put in some new cement and then see if the trees can get through there. I don't know. Um, but, I mean, things grow amazingly. If you've ever had green beans in your garden, you know, you pick your green beans, and then you go out the next day, and there's just as many green beans. And you pick them, and then you go out the next day, and there's just as many green beans. They drove me crazy when I was a kid, because my mom always sent me out to pick the green beans. And it's like I was never done with the job. But that's how abundant they are. That's how abundant they are. You know, and even like the, the fish in the Minnesota lakes with as many fishermen in we ha as we have and as many fish as they catch, uh, we never seem to run out of fish in our lakes. There's just piles and piles of fish. Um, it's very abundant, and God makes it that way. Uh, now, what about people who are hungry? There are hungry people in the world, right? In Pine City, are there hungry people? Yes. That's because everyone, everything costs money, though. Yeah. Do you know any kids who are hungry in Pine City? You do? They're at school? Yeah. And their family's just fine? Everything's good? You know, usually when people are hungry, there's something wrong. You know, the parents aren't there. The parents have split up. The family's broken up. Um, there's something wrong which leads to that. Uh, a lot of times it has something to do with mental illness. Uh, and sometimes it has to do with the economy and the greed of people that have kind of wrecked things in our economy. 
regularly. Um, there's not many hungry people in Pine City, I'm quite sure of that, uh, because for one thing we provide for them, right? Send home backpacks and send them to the food shelf and whatever. Um, if they're really hungry, they aren't paying attention to the resources we have, right? Um, there are places in the world where people are truly hungry, and that would be like in uh, South Korea or Somalia. If you're not familiar with those parts of the world, uh, they're very difficult places because of their government. In, in North Korea, the, the leader of North Korea will not spend money on agriculture or, or on getting food to people who need it. He spends money on building nuclear weapons that he can shoot at the United States on rockets. Hasn't been able to do that yet. He's still trying. Don't worry, we're pretty far from the West Coast. I don't think he'll make it to us. He might make it, you know, as far as, you know, northern Washington. Uh, but um, almost always, uh, in the case of hunger, there is some human reason that that happens. Almost always some human reason. If, if it were all up to God, if there would be, well, there is plenty of food. We throw feed, food away and people go hungry uh, because of this crazy, the way we run things. Um, and, and it's uh, never is hunger about a lack of food. That sounds like a strange comment, doesn't it? But it's always about people not being able to get the food that is there. Okay? What about people who are homeless? Well, again, some of it has to do with the crazy economy we have where things cost too much and and uh, people can't get good paying jobs and, and things like that. But a lot of times, most people who are homeless, and I've seen studies on this, most people who are homeless uh, have psychological problems. They're depressed or they're anxious or they're paranoid uh, and they are unable to work because their mind is, does not see the world correctly. That's a more common thing than you think. You know, I've got a, nephew who uh, he has Asperger's which is a, a, a form of uh, well what is it uh, on the uh, on, he's on the spectrum the uh, would bipolar do that too? well bipolar certainly fits into those categories yeah but uh, but my nephew is uh, autistic that's that's the word I'm looking for he's on the autism spectrum and, and the the brand that he has is called uh, Asperger's. Well, he he uh, has always had trouble with his temper. That's part of his Asperger's, and and uh, he got mad and burned somebody's house down. And so he went to prison for ten years, which seemed like a long time. But anyway, that's what the state of Wisconsin determined was fair. So he is he just he got out. out. He just got out, and now he's his well, his dad is trying to. Find him a job. So Wait, that was work. that the house that burned down in Pine City? No, oh. it was over in. Well, the house wasn't even in Grantsburg. He lived in Grantsburg, and the house was out in the country. This is, I mean, it was ten years ago. Oh yeah. It was, um, but uh, but his dad's trying to find him a job, but you know he can't follow directions very well. He can't get along with people very well. He has a very short attention span, and he gets angry really fast. Well, what would be a good job for him? I don't know either. I'm not sure there is a good job for him. I don't know that there's a job he can keep because some of, of some of the issues he has, and that's part of the problem. There's a lot of people that they, they really can't keep a job because of the, the issues that they have going on in their own lives. Uh, and so it's not that God doesn't take care of people so that they can have homes. There's plenty of homes. And we can build a lot more homes. You know, I, I, I read a, an article, oh, it was only a couple months ago, and a guy had done a study, and there are actually more homes for sale in the United States than there are homeless people. So if we would just, we could just move all the homeless people into homes that are already vacant and up for sale. Of course, it would cost a lot of money, and nobody's going to pay for that. And 
the people that have them for sale, they want the money out of the house. They don't want to put a homeless person in there. But see, it's our own greed that causes homelessness. And it's people's issues that have that cause homelessness. Do you ever see the movie The Pursuit of Happiness? No? No? All right. Will Smith. It was a good movie. It was entertaining. But it was about a guy who was homeless and then became very wealthy. And he, while he was homeless, he got in this uh, apprenticeship program, internship maybe it would be a better term for it, and uh, it was to sell securities and things and, and to get rich, really. And he chose to stay in the internship, even though he wasn't being paid, and stay homeless. Because he didn't want to just make enough money to live, he wanted to be rich. So it's homelessness. You can't, you can't blame that on God. That, that can be blamed directly on him. He was greedy. Well, for him it worked out. Except he and his son had to be homeless for like four months. It didn't look like it was very pleasant. At least in the movie, I'm thinking it was fairly true to life. What about incurable diseases? Well, that's a problem, isn't it? I mean, there are incurable diseases. Cancer. I mean, they can do things to cancer. They can cure some of them now, but there's a, most cancers they can't cure. When they treat a cancer, they give you chemo or something. All they're really doing is extend the cancer, right? They're, you still have it. You know when they say somebody's cancer-free, are they really cancer-free? No. They're cancer-free as far as they know, but almost always the cancer pops up again uh, someplace. Um, does that mean that God can't stop those diseases? No. no, he certainly can. Why doesn't he? Why is there sickness in the world? You know, if God created everything good, why is there sickness in the world? So you can have a break. <laughs> so you can have a break. You can get sick and just stay home and yeah. in bed. Yeah, well, that's nice. Sure. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, let's hope it's not cancer that's keeping you at home in bed. That wouldn't be very good, would it? Uh, you know, or dementia. You know, I mean, there are some pretty nasty things, right? You know? Well, when Adam and Eve sinned, the world became sinful. Things are not the way God wants them to be. And death entered the world. Before Adam and Eve sinned, there was no death. I'm, I'm quite convinced, had they not sinned, they would have never died, Adam and Eve. Um, of course, we don't know that, because they did sin. So there's, it's, whatever I say about that is simply speculation. But, but then disease entered the world. Disease entered the world. And you know what? Uh, if maybe a couple thousand years later was Noah's Ark. And imagine the world when they came out of the ark. What did they find? They found a whole lot of dead stuff, right? Because all the people had drowned, the animals had drowned, uh, the plants were probably, many of them killed by, the, by being covered with water for that long. Because plants can't handle that. You know, you ever drive by a river that has flooded regularly and you'll always see dead trees along the edge because they can't handle it. If their roots are constantly in water, they can't handle it and they die. Uh, yeah, and what happens when you have dead bodies rotting? Well, there's, there's disease, it smells, right? Yeah, but there's disease, there's bacteria in there and things like that, uh, which is, is why we have such careful laws about how we handle dead bodies. We really do. I mean, there are there's a legal limit to how long you can leave a dead body without getting it embalmed or or cremated. I believe it's 72 hours, 3 days. Because it will create germs and disease and and, uh, and well think when the whole earth was covered with dead dead bodies. I mean, there are diseases everywhere. Actually, if you look at the ages of people in the Bible, remember we looked at Methuselah? He lived to be 969 years. And you guys kind of, what? 900, that's pretty old, right? 
But see, he was before the flood. So there weren't nearly as many diseases or things like that. It would kind of suck to live that long, though. Well, you would think, except, you know, maybe he was just a lot healthier, you know? Uh, I mean, if, he, if his body deteriorated at the same rate that mine does, you know, uh, for the last 900 years of his life, he'd have had a lot of aches and pains, so that wouldn't have been very fun. But, you know, things had to be different then, I'm thinking. But, um, but that's, that's how disease uh, comes into the world. It comes through death. It comes through sin. We can't live forever because we're sinners. And so we die. And so maybe we die of cancer, or maybe we die of dementia, or maybe we get hit by a bus. Stay out of the way of buses. You know, they'll hit you and they'll kill you just like that. I don't like my bus. Really? My bus driver's rude. What's your name? Steve. Oh, hey, Steve. Oh, you know Steve? Steve who? Uh, I don't know his last name. Oh, okay. He's an older guy. An older guy. Oh, well, you know how those older guys are. Yeah, they're grumpy. No, but like, if you're like not... Like you? Yeah, mm -hmm. Hey, if you're not even near your seat, you'll get a bus, bus report. There we go. And like, if you have food in your bag and it, you can, he can see it, you'll get, a, you'll get a bus report. So you've gotten in trouble, and that's yeah. why you're mad about it. Yeah. Well, just follow the rules, would you? Okay, if food is in my bag for later during the school day, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to eat it at like 7 in the morning, mm -hmm. I don't eat that early, so I wait till like 9 mm -hmm. o'clock more, and then eat. Okay, but well, if he sees it, then close it up. Get bus attention. Close it up so he can't see it. I'm thinking he saw the food because you were putting it in your mouth. That's what I'm thinking. I don't eat that early in the morning. Who agrees with me on that? Oh, you chickens. Come <laughs> on. Anyway. Um, and so, you know, there are diseases out there. And God doesn't cure them because, because of our sin we die. And so there, we have to die somehow. And, and so uh, the diseases are around. Uh, they are not incurable to God. They're simply incurable to us. And, and actually scientists figure out how to cure these diseases from time to time. Um, you know, there's a, an ad on TV right now saying, you know, the last, the person is now living. The first person, um, how's that? The first person to live through Alzheimer's is now living. They don't know who it is, of course, but, but what they're saying is that they'll sometime in, in our lifetime, well, in your lifetime, probably not mine, but in your lifetime, they'll cure all <coughs> Well, do you think so? I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, they make, they make progress on these things, right? Uh, but here's the deal. When they, when they cure Alzheimer's, there will be something else. Because, you know, when I was a kid, nobody talked about Alzheimer's. But now it's very common. But see, they took care of some other things that caused people to die. Like, childbirth is much safer. You know, 100 years ago, like a third of the women, no, no, a fourth, tenth of the women died in childbirth, as did their children. But now they've made it pretty safe. I mean, it still happens. Occasionally you'll hear of a woman who dies giving birth because she loses too much blood or something, but almost never does that happen anymore. They've made it safe. They've made our workplaces safer. They've, you know, done so much with heart disease. When I was a kid, almost every man that I knew close enough when they died that I knew how they died, almost everyone died of a heart attack. But they've fixed that now. They can do bypass and they can put valves in and they can do all this stuff. Um, but the more, but as they fix diseases, then these new ones come up. COVID. COVID. Yeah, there's an interesting one, huh? Yeah. And now they, you know, we've got shots, so we don't get COVID. But, you know, then the COVID mutates and becomes a different kind of a COVID. And, and you know, people still die from it, although not nearly as many anymore. But, <clears throat> yeah, uh, there's always going to be a disease because we are always going to die. And, and, and unfortunately, our, in our country, our, our society, people feel like, well, if I continually uh, eat healthy and exercise and get all the right shots and take all the right vitamins, I, I won't die. I got news for you. You're going to die anyway. But anyway. Dark. 
You know, I got I got some COVID shots. I got three of them actually. I got three of them too. Oh, oh, there we're we're equally healthy or unhealthy because some people say the shots are bad. I got this many. Really? I never even got COVID. Yeah, well, I didn't get COVID either, but um, I, I'll tell you, I got shots for COVID not because I was afraid to die because I'm really not afraid to die, and let's face it, I'm way older than you. I'm gonna die before you do, but. Um, but I had people to visit, and you remember it's kind of a crazy time. They didn't let you go into places and get together in groups and whatever, but I had people in nursing homes, and I wanted to be able to say to the nursing home people, I've had my COVID shots, as many as, you know, up to three now. And, and they were much more likely to let me in if I told them that. You know, you have your shots and you put a mask on, they would let you in just about any place. And, and so uh, that was so I could do that. Um, but anyway, uh, God does take care of our health. Our health is really quite good, honestly. The body God made us is pretty good. I mean, how often do you get sick? Never. Never. I'm one never. of the people in the household who well, I never get sick. Like yeah, everyone well, why else, were you gone last week then? Because I, no, because I, they, everyone thought I had Oh, strep. it's okay. Strep. strep. Yeah. Throat. Yeah. And we were testing it, but we didn't know. But if you yeah. don't get sick, I mean, that's pretty amazing that your body can fight off all these sicknesses that everybody else, quite frankly, is getting, right? The last time I got sick was my birthday. Yeah. Okay, and what happened then? You I, went to the hospital and you had surgery? No. What did you do? I had to stay home. I couldn't open my eyes without them in pain. Yeah. I was throwing up, like, daily. Yeah. And how did you get better? Taking meds. Last time I was okay. really sick, I was in the hospital. Were you? All right. Yeah, but mostly you, you rested. You know, you might have taken some medic <coughs> medication or you might have eaten correctly. Uh, but for the most part, almost every time you get sick, you get better just by resting, eating well. Right? Almost always. You know, you cut your finger. Do you go and get stitches? No. Hardly yes. ever. You might get stitches once in a while. Um, in my life, I have never had stitches I except had for stitches. Um, I've had two surgeries, and those involved stitches. But those are the only stitches I've had. And I've cut myself a lot of times. Here, I, I cut myself just the other day. Right there it is. Yep. And you know what's going to happen with that if I don't get it stitched? Not right here. It's going to heal, right? It's kind of amazing, isn't it? It just heals. I don't have to do anything. Actually, now, it's probably going to heal better if I keep it clean, right? Probably. Yeah. And when my mom had a bad wound, the doctor told her, you should eat protein, and that'll help it to heal faster. So, so we had her eating hamburgers and stuff, which I, I don't think she appreciated. But anyway. Um, because God makes our bodies so that they heal. So that they heal. I didn't know your, your bad wrist was contagious. <laughs> Payne, why oh. did you do this to me? Olivia's Stop. caught Olivia's caught your wrist now, huh? Stop. Yeah. Well, that's what you get for sitting next to her. What's this beepy noise? Um, my wife is doing is ironing on some vinyl in my office. You keep scaring me. Well, it's there's nothing to be scared of. Linda should be scared because if she puts her hand in there, she's gonna burn it. But that would be her fault. I'm not okay. My dog, if he goes near me. Yeah. Well, but see, Church has one of these T-shirt presses, you know, where you put the shirt in and you clamp it down and it irons the whole thing at once. She has an iron at home that's like this big that she can kind of move around and do it. But sometimes she just comes here and uses Church's because it's it's easier. It does a better faster. job. It's faster. Yeah. But it's it beeps. Yeah, I'm sorry that scares you. Oh my God. But it's just Linda. Don't be scared of Linda. She's fine. I'm kind of scared of Linda. Yeah. You're scared of Linda? Yeah, she's yeah. pretty scared. Are you scared of Linda? No, see, Bailey's. Y'all are supposed to say that. Oh, you're scared. You're supposed to say that. You know, when Linda comes out, I'm going to tell her class is scared of her. And listen to what she says. All right. Does God provide for all that you need? Is there anything you need that you don't have? Yes. No. What? Food right now. 
food right now. Yeah, I'm well, that's that not, it's not that you don't have it, it's that I'm a mean teacher and I won't let you eat in class, right? Shucks. So, I mean, actually, there's food in this building that you could have right now if I was a nicer person, which I'm not. Shucks. Right? Um, but the fact is, you don't worry about if you're going to have meals tomorrow because you will have meals tomorrow, right? Well, then yeah. that. I mean, anything could happen. I mean, I could get hit by a car tonight. Yeah, but you'll, you'll still have food. <laughs> True about that. But, right, and we do die from things, but it's not because God doesn't provide. It's not because we don't have access to these things. Um, you know, even the fact that we are smart enough to come up with vaccines for COVID, you know, is a testament to how wonderfully God's made us that we can think about this stuff. Well, I can't. I mean, I couldn't have come up with a vaccine for COVID, but there were people out there smart enough to do that, right? And, and how wonderful that is. So God really does provide all that we need. Now, he doesn't do it magically. You know, uh, if, you, uh, uh, if you go, if you were to just go home and just sit and pray for food, and you know nobody in the house works and nobody goes to the grocery store and you just sit there and pray for food what are the chances you're going to starve to death 100 yeah pretty good pretty good i mean god could provide miraculously with food for you right he could he's done it in the past certainly but chances are he's not because most of the time he doesn't answer us in those ways so most of the time he doesn't provide for us miraculously but he has put you into families where your parents do take care of you and make sure you have stuff to eat. You know, even before you even knew what eating was, your parents were feeding you. You know, and at some point they taught you to use a spoon. I'm hoping. Do all of you know how to use a spoon? No. It's a spoon. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I, don't well. how to use, I don't know how to use a fork. A fork? Yeah. Forks are more fun because you can stab with a fork. You and know? you can put the little macaroni noodles on the little things. <laughs> That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you eat bugles? The what? Bugles? Are they little, like, pointy yeah, yeah. yeah. You oh, put them on your fingers? fingers? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that cool? That's like the funnest thing in the world. Yeah, really, it's not. I used to put raspberries on my fingers. Yeah. Oh, that I would Always. never do. I would yeah. never do that. I was weird as a child, like, as a five-year-old. Bailey, what food do you put on your fingers? Did you cover yourself with Nutella? Yes. <laughs> not naked. Do you? Do you? I don't know what it is about bugles. It's like everybody in the world puts them on their I fingers. I used to eat stick of butter, a stick of butter when I was younger all the time. Whenever I'd see butter, I'd... Yeah, that's I know. something you well, would that's do. that's very interesting. You I know Ray? You guys know Ray, right? My grandson. Isn't he like the yeah. one that's like that, that Yeah, tall? he's like eight feet tall or whatever he's, he is. He is actually 6'3". 6'3". Well, that's great. Um, anyway, uh, Ray drinks pickle juice. You know, you get a jar of pickles, pickle juice. And, and we'll eat the pickles out of the jar, and he'll just take the jar and drink the pickle juice. <laughs> it's like, Ray, you are, you're you going to do damage to your brain or something. I don't know what. I mean, isn't that? But anyway. But we do have, we have lots of, uh, we have everything we need. And through our families, we are, get everything that we need. And of course, because of sin in the world, sometimes families aren't good. Some families are not as good as others, and sometimes people struggle, but it's always because of their own sin. It's not because of a lack of God's goodness. God is good, and he provides for our needs. All of those things that are listed in the meaning of the first article of the creed, you know, house and home, land and animals, wife and children, food, drink, clothing, and shoes. How many pairs of shoes do you have, Olivia? I have... Probably eight. See, God is good, right? And, and you know, I hate to admit this. I think 15? I, I think I probably have more than eight. I think I have more than fifteen. Because I have a couple of church pairs of shoes. I have a couple of everyday kinds of shoes. I have at least two, probably three pairs of shoes that I use when I work outdoors because they can get all messy and gucky, and I don't care because they're old shoes. They used to be some good shoes of mine, and now they're old. So. I keep them in the garage and I put them on and then when they're falling apart, I just throw them away because it works, it works good that way. I have at least three pairs of Crocs. Yeah, see Crocs, which aren't really shoes at all. It's like strapping a sponge to your foot, you know. <laughs> but, but we have more than we need. 
you, I'm sure, I'm going to take a wild guess that all three of you have more clothes than you could wear <laughs> if you put on different clothes every day for two weeks, you'd still have clothes, right? Mine yeah, lasted right? Three mm -hmm. years. Yeah. And you know what? I'm no different. I look in my closet, I probably have 30 shirts, like dress up shirts, button up shirts like this. Why? I don't need 30 shirts. I can only I wear one at a time, truthfully. But anyway, but see, the world is abundant, and, and so we get things, and, and they're, and most of the time they're just not even that expensive because it's so easy to make things and it's so easy to grow things. Who so makes God it? does provide them for all that we need. Okay, now, what's the next paragraph about after God providing? Um, I know, I know. The second article. He defends me. Does the garden protect? Uh oh. Yes, he does. Okay, what about your wrist? He... Did he protect your wrist? Not really. No! What's the matter with God, anyway? Because God, God's mad at you. Yeah. I know. You sinful little person. <laughs> Shucks. Wow. Because I'm too injured. You, you better watch it. Something's going to happen to you on the way home. I'm pretty sure of it. But anyway, um, yeah, you know, the thing is, God does guard and protect us, but, but sometimes we still get hurt. And it's not that God doesn't care about your wrist. I think he does. I don't know. I keep, I keep injuring it. But he cares more about other things. He's going to guard and protect you spiritually. And the fact is, we are going to get hurt, and we are going to die. I mean, these are things that happen in this world, and God doesn't stop it from happening. But he does guard and protect us from what we need to be guarded and protected from. And sometimes he does that through giving us a brain where we're smart enough to do things. You know, you guys are way too young to remember the show Cheers, uh, which was a very funny show, a good show. Oh, I know that show. Pardon? I know that show. You know that show? No. It's about Sam Malone, a former Major League Baseball player. And he had stopped playing baseball because he became an alcoholic and he couldn't play baseball anymore. And you know what Sam Malone did for a living in the show Cheers? This is way after his baseball career. You know what he did? He owned a bar. Now that's not very smart. He's an alcoholic. And he owns all And he's bar. serving drinks all day. Does this make sense? No, he should not be doing no. that. He, he was not a very smart guy. And actually in the show a couple times, he did end up going back into alcoholism. Uh, but. But God gives us a brain where we're, we're actually smart enough, if we're not in a comedy show on TV, we're smart enough to know that if we're alcoholics, we don't work in a bar, right? Uh, if, uh, if we have a, a tendency to, um, to embezzle money, we don't work as accountants. Because we're smart enough to stay away from these things, to guard and protect ourselves. We're smart enough to drive our car reasonably. You know, most cars, if you really step on the gas, it'll go really fast. Mm -hmm. Most cars will go really fast these days. Mm -hmm. so I would say there's not a car out there that won't go 100 if you, if you step on the gas good enough. But why don't we drive them 100 all the time? Because then you have, like, a better chance you of being injured and, like, you yeah. also risk other people getting hurt. Yeah, you're, you're risking other people getting hurt and yourself getting hurt. And God guards and protects us by giving us brains, right? And he guards and protects us by giving us parents. And he guards and protects us by giving us the church where people look after us and watch over us. Uh, and so we, we avoid uh, injuries and, and sickness uh, as much as we can. It's still there and still going to get us, but God is guarding and protecting us so that we're not injured all the time. We're not sick all the time. Right? Peyton didn't get COVID. Hmm? That was all God because she didn't even get a shot. Right? And my parents had COVID like right after they got home from whatever you call it. Um, a population. Walmart? Las Vegas. Oh, what, Las Vegas. I was thinking Walmart. But Las go ahead. Vegas. Yeah. But then Las they Vegas. came back and I never got it. And they had it for like around three weeks. We all got COVID after Florida. 
Did you? My whole entire family. I mean, we know my mom got it. She got tested. So you but... weren't you weren't smart enough to stay away from it. Is what you're saying? So. Okay. Did you have fun in Florida? Yeah. And you just got sick when you got home. Yeah. I went to University. So. Disney World. So. Like. Okay. So. So here's the deal. You went down to Florida, got COVID, and brought it back to us. Is that what you're saying? It was a year ago, though. No. Okay. Well, yeah. I didn't get it either. But anyway, um, yeah. Now I have, what about Newtown, Connecticut? You don't even remember that because that's a long time ago, but there was a school shooting in Newtown, Connecticut. And think about a school shooting. You know, there was a shooting today at a university in Las Vegas. Yes? Um, I saw a video of a shooting in Pine City in the high school. Really? Yeah. I it was showing like Pine City and there was like a recap or whatever of like a shooting. It was probably the police trying to shoot me. Oh. I don't, uh, I don't think there's been a shooting at Pine City High. Uh, at least not in the 26 years I've been here. But, um, but it happens all the time, right? So is God not guarding, protecting those people? Well, again, he's right. watching over them. Uh, but but uh, there's bad things in the world, right? And God lets some things happen. You know, we're all going to die. So God's concern, more than causing us to live a long time, God's concern is to watch over us and protect us spiritually. And he works hard to do that through his church, through his word, through the sacrament. He's always trying to guard us spiritually so that we live with him forever rather than that we live forever on this earth, which isn't possible because of sin. Um, and so it's... Uh, God's guarding and protecting is, is a different kind of thing that we look at. God looks at it different than we do. Yeah. Let's look at Luke 12. Jesus said to his disciples, I'm starting at verse 22, by the way, in case you weren't looking at the slide up here. Jesus said to his disciples, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on, for life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap, they have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour of span to his life, if then you are not able to do such a small thing as that. Why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even, in Sol even Solomon in his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass which is alive in the field today and tomorrow thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you are to eat or what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with the treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. God not only provides for us, but he warns us, because he provides so well, he warns us not to love the things of this world, but to love him instead. And sometimes he lets us struggle just because it will point us back to him. All right, I think we can finish this last slide and be done with uh, the first article. Where do angels fit in? Let's read Psalm 91. And I put angels here because angels are part of creation. You know that uh, when you die, you, you become an angel. You know that's just absolutely not true. Biblically, angels were created by God. 
Psalm 91. Found it. Okay. Just had to let you know I found it. That's great. Yeah. Now let's just look at verse 11. I'm not going to read the whole psalm today. Psalm 91, verse 11. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways on their hands. They will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. God's angels guard us. And of course, that's kind of like God watching over us and protecting us. It's part of that. Uh, but they don't guard us from everything, right? Things still happen. That's okay. It doesn't mean God's lying to us. It just means that he lets things happen to us because it draws us to him. Um, can we see angels? I've got questions up here. Can we see angels? No. Sometimes, right? People have seen angels, but not always. Um, are they here now? Are there angels here now? Yes, I see one right there. There. Well, if they're guarding... No, that's a star, actually. No, it looks like an angel. Oh, is there an angel up there, too? No, no, it looks like something that looks to me a little bit. Watch see? out, you're about to walk in the angel. Do you see it? No angel yeah, on the it. tree. Right All right. Right there. Um, it's flying right there. Okay, um, a couple of things about angels. Uh, number one, it is not true that when you die, you become an angel. That's only in bad movies that that happens. Uh, the Bible does not say that we become angels. Actually, in heaven, we're better than the angels. Who are the angels? Because we're created in God's image. Angels were created by God separately, just like he created the world. And created people. He created angels. And they are his servants. And their name, angel, uh, is... It they... means, it's from angelos, which means to, uh, to give a message. Are they they're, built like us? They're messengers. Well, they are sometimes and they aren't sometimes. Um, I mean, usually when an angel appears to someone, what's the first thing they say? What is that? They say, don't be afraid. That's what the angels oh. say. Don't be afraid. So I'm thinking they must not look exactly like us. They must look somewhat scary. Whoa. Because that's the first thing they say is don't be afraid. Uh, right? I don't know. And um, uh, when, when are angels... Like in the Bible, when do we see angels in the Bible? At your worst times. Okay, like name a time in the Bible. When you're about to die. Name a time in the Bible. Oh. When are angels mentioned in the Bible? Well, one of them is coming up soon, right? Christmas. Christmas. The birth of Jesus, were there angels? East. What did angels do at Christmas? <gasps> I don't know what else. Angels do. Angels. No, do. no. We're going, we're, what do ang, what did angels do at that first Christmas? Oh my goodness. Oh my gosh. Linda, they're, they're they're flunking today. What did angels do at that first Christmas, Linda? Yeah. Yeah, in the sky, and they were talking to shepherds. Shepherds, remember? And there were shepherds in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Be not afraid. For I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be for all people. For you. Good tidings of great Perfect. Perfect, yes. And so angels are there to announce something. 